Welcome to this episode of Podcastle in the Sky. In this episode, we'll be looking at two pieces of pop culture from 2017 that deal with World War I in a fantasy way. The anime is the saga of Tanya the Evil, also known as Yojo Senki. And the other piece is the film Wonder Woman. I'm William. I'm Amber. Uh, I'm John. I'm Jesse. All right. So I would like to kick things off by actually commenting on both because one thing that I really appreciated about both of these was they both, and maybe it was because both of them are about war, you know, but they both really bring in the idea of humanity being kind of incredibly sucky and, you know, reliant on vengeance and things like that. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like it's two characters coming to terms in different ways with the worst aspects of humanity. And like, you know, Wonder Woman, she comes to the conclusion that even if humanity has a serious downside, it doesn't matter. She'll still fight for what is right because that is what is right. She believes that if she keeps fighting, she can help humanity reach a, you know, a better state, if you will. Meanwhile, Tanya, her whole deal is essentially using humanity's worst attributes against her enemies. Anybody who is too vengeful, anybody who is too angry, she flips it and uses it uh, specifically to get ahead for herself only. Everything she does, even the the heroic things she does for her team are for her own benefit. I don't know. I just, I really liked that both shows showed the darker side of humanity and showed what different personalities do with the discovery of that darker side. Well, the thing is that Wonder Woman is a hero, a superhero, and Tanya is, uh, is basically the villain. We're watching the bad guy winning. Basically, it's the saga of Tanya the Evil, which um, I can't actually remember the last time an anime had the villain as the protagonist. Yeah, I can only think of, um, what was that? He's not quite a villain overlord. He kind of gradually becomes more villainous over the course of the story, whereas Tanya is basically evil from the outset. And, and it, it is fun, like Amber said, in the sense that, you know, Wonder Woman is, is obviously this hero character who's always, no matter what the odds or the structural forces against her, she's, you know, larger than life character who's going to do the right thing. Whereas Tanya is sort of a more uh, relatable character in a dark way in the sense that you are placed into this uh, environment, into this world. And there are all these big structural forces at play that are much larger than you. And so you sort of adapt yourself to them in ways that are not necessarily conducive to being a good person. And Tanya's interesting in the second episode. For those who haven't watched the show, the conceit here is that Tanya is a Japanese businessman who is sort of the ultimate capitalist. They just emotionless are running purely off logic to promote their own interests uh, and purely their own interests. And they fire someone who in an act of rage pushes them in front of a train and they're about to die. But then God intervenes basically, or this mysterious God like being called being X intervenes and basically says, you're faithless. You believe in nothing but yourself and reason. And so I'm going to reincarnate you into a pseudo world war one environment where you will learn faith by being put through endless trials and warfare, which sounds ridiculous, but it works somehow. But uh, in her character introduction and everything, she's, or he, he slash she, is, you know, referencing the Chicago School of Economics, and all these sort of classical, you know, ultra-rationalist views of the world. And it's fun to get, uh, have those, what's, what's most compelling, I think. A, it's just a fun show. Tanya's, uh, she's a villain, but she's also sort of clever, but then the world, turns against her in a way that it's sort of fun to see her get her comeuppance as well. And it's fun to see her sort of ultra-rationalistic view of society butting up with these more sort of deeper emotional aspects or sort of ideological aspects like nationalism that drive people in ways that are much different than the way she understands. Uh, well, Tanya the Evil, it's basically the story of Job, except this story, Job, is 
it's a bad guy, basically. It's about God trying to make a bad guy into a good person, or not even a good person, just someone who actually worships God. I think the God in here would still be fine with Tanya being evil, as long as she actually worships him. Yeah, you, I think Do you definitely... think so? I don't know. I, I'm a little... I'm kind of on the fence about whether or not that God is wanting just pure worship, because during the businessman's death scene, being X straight up says that people nowadays not only have no faith, they have no morality, they have no empathy for the people around them, and laments this while also lamenting the very idea of allowing whoever this guy is and will be future Tanya to be reborn at all, because why have anybody with such an immoral outlook on life live again, you know what I mean? It seemed to me that it was not just about the belief in being X, it was also the very idea of being empathetic towards your fellow man, because he also has a whole speech about morality being for weaker men, and it's not just the belief aspect, it's also being moral you know it's for people who are weak as well as belief being for people who are desperate so i don't know yeah, I, mean, I kind of think of that i think you're right because with being x i mean obviously uh the show doesn't really the series is in progress uh, as a light novel series so who knows where it is right now or where it's going but you know this mysterious godlike being being x uh i think there's sort of the, their initial intent i think does sort of map on to what you're saying but there's an interesting element here where being X and Tanya have this almost rivalry that develops. And I think you sort of start to see spite these sort of human elements start to manifest themselves in the way that being X behaves towards Tanya in the sense that, you know, being X themselves is supposed to be um, the sort of figure that is above everything that sees this greater moral picture. But as the story gets deeper and Tanya continues to sort of rebuff the belief in being X as something that they want to worship because they're so self-interested in, in the kind of worshiping themselves. You know, being X starts to do things a lot like Ares does in the Wonder Woman movie where, you know, they uh, make sure that the report on how to commit war crimes within the laws of war gets onto the right person's desk. They make sure to give the missile engineer an epiphany. And so they're taking these actions that perpetuate war just to get the conversion of this one individual who just will not submit to them, basically. There's a fun rivalry element there in the sense um, that's a little more interesting than what they do in the Wonder Woman movie with Ares, who is, plays the same sort of role of a behind-the-scenes perpetuator of war, but is mostly, you know, that kind of wants Wonder Woman's power, uh, whereas... What being X wants from Tanya is more like a theological submission. Well, Tanya the Evil, like, for me, there was always this tension between, uh, the themes it was handling, you know, sacrifice, war, uh, anti war message, uh, that kind of thing, and the inherent dumbness of the premise, because <laughs> it's, a, it's like, uh, it's a Japanese businessman reincarnated as a little girl with, like, supernatural powers to fight in World War One. It's, it's absurd on its surface. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. really entertaining. And don't get me wrong, I, I really like the movie, but um, I don't know, not the movie, the TV show. But these the debates about morality are wrapped up in this very, uh, very schlocky story. I think that's also something that's true with Wonder Woman in a way that it acknowledges, like uh, the Scottish character says, "This is rubbish." You know, I mean, it casts itself in this very highfalutin Greek epic, but it also has its roots in the pulpier elements of comic books. Like, Wonder Woman has this uh, lasso of truth, you know, and she lives on this island which has been sequestered from the world for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years until she suddenly decides to re-enter society. And I think in terms of tackling the types of themes that they're going for, in some ways, I, I think the almost shocky, over-the-top elements were and having Tanya be more of a villainous character, I think actually works in its favor. Because for me, um, you know, I enjoyed Wonder Woman, but thematically, you know, I feel this way about a lot of the superhero movies that try to have themes in them, which, you know, I appreciate, obviously. And I, I'd rather they try than just be uh, mindless. But like Winter Soldier or whatever was the same thing, where there's, there is this 
tension between the traditional heroic action movie aspect and the more critical aspects of what it's trying to say. Um, particularly with Wonder Woman, you know, there's a, cause, uh, Wonder Woman is set in, you know, it's like the final month or two weeks or something of, of World War I. The, the war is about to end. And, you know, on one hand, obviously, her mission and the mission of her allies is very noble. It's to try and stop very, very fictionalized Eric von Ludendorff from using this weapon that'll allow Germany to sort of turn the tides and, and keep the war going. But there's sort of this weird tension between the humanistic aspects of it. But then, you know, Ares, who's, you know, the god of war, and he's trying to perpetuate the war behind the scenes. He's this character, and his plan never made full sense to me. I, I get what he was trying to do in the movie, but it didn't really work because he's pretending to be a, sort of a peace advocate who's trying to get the armistice signed. But then he's, like, trying to interfere with their heroes. And having him be the advocate for armistice didn't really make sense to me. You know, it wasn't like at the end of World War One or th- all throughout World War One, despite the horrible losses, there weren't politicians and generals who were just absolute hawks who were saying, yeah, like like the real Ludendorff was. And so to, to have him, you know, I get that it makes for a better twist, but it didn't really work. And similarly, when you're trying to tell a sort of, like, humanistic storyline, it creates problems when you want to have the traditional action scene where it's like Wonder Woman is blowing the shit out of those German soldiers. And it's like, it's, you know, it's not like they're, this is World War II and they're SS or something. Like, that's just Fritz from, you know, uh, Bavaria and he got conscripted and now he's getting blown the fuck out. <laughs> like, especially the the fact that they kept emphasizing that the armistice is on the way. I was like, oh, poor Fritz. He died three days before the war ended. That sucks. <laughs> and so there was that tension there. And, and so I think what I then appreciate in terms of what Tanya is doing is that it, because, you know, it is an action show and it does have well done action scenes that are exciting. And then, you know, you can't make an anti-war movie. I can't remember what filmmaker said that, but. I think it was Truffaut. Yeah, I think you're right. But so by acknowledging the sort of inherently psychopathic aspects of its main character and also the, the sort of delusional abstraction that her fellow high command generals, except for the one guy, view war. I think it does a better job of sort of articulating the the, the madness of it at that high on that macro level where the human cost just sort of gets absolutely wiped away. And it does a and likewise Tony does a nice job of, of setting up characters on the other side who are good people and die for no reason um and it, it does the uh, i think a better job of uh, of drawing out that humanistic aspect of sort of you know particularly with the war like world war one moving the tv show don't really touch on like you know why world war one is happening and almost on some level it's almost not important but i think tiny does a good makes a good choice in in establishing the evil of its character because then it can sort of portray those sorts of things and not feel the need to make the actions of his character heroic because in a lot of these circumstances heroism is just not an option for anyone in these in these situations well yeah i think that i i mean i totally agree with you re um the one real problem that i had with wonder woman aside from the fact that it sort of wore its aren't humans kind of shitty on their own aspect on its sleeve a few times like oh look at this guy he has horrible PTSD oh look at this guy he's the wrong color of this era to become an actor you know what I mean like oh right. look you have to put on a dress to function in this society and you can't go into a room full of arguing MPs you know like that was very blatant you know and I would be like every time I'd kind of like been a little bit more subtle so <laughs> you know movie yeah it was kind uh, of that like, like i'm not an old 19th century person how about that <laughs> yeah exactly but other than that the true thing that i really had a problem with was it's world war one a war that historians pretty much say was like just a clusterfuck and no real bad guys if you will yeah no i get what you mean and what does chris pine say practically one of the first things he says to wonder woman is those are the bad guys i'm trying to save people from the bad guys and pointing at the germans and like you've got these german soldiers for instance in the town that's under siege it's like these german soldiers in town who are presented as baddies because they were told to take this town you know what i mean and right yeah there's that tension yeah, yeah, like, yeah. There's, that, there's the one shot where she um punches the guy out the window with her shield oh, yeah. and it's like all in slow motion i was like it's just really hard to 
to take that like real world like people died really horribly and yeah and, and match it with like yeah punch the shit out of him out that window and and you know at the same time I'm like well you know Austro-Hungarians and the Germans do owe a disproportionate amount of blame for the war but that's not it's not Joe German soldier's fault um you know so it's yeah it's tough to do the action movie thing and like the war is horrible thing at the same time it's just yeah it's, and you're right Tanya did it so much that, like. Man, that one episode where they have to go into the town where the occupied people are rebelling yeah, and destroy it, and the soldiers who are told that they have to do this. I love the breakdown of the soldiers. I love how to get them past their guilt. Tanya said that it was her fault. All of this basically blatant murder, you know, to keep terrorists from rising up in the future. Like, I just love that. At this point, I would say the Germans were the quote-unquote bad guys, but you see, like, the why behind it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I will say, like, I think they were smart to, in Wonder Woman, to, to make Ludendorff the villain. I mean, not that real Ludendorff and fictional Ludendorff are particularly similar than Ludendorff lived through the war and all that, but he was a yeah. real asshole. And so I, He I was, guess. but I wonder if they were smart. Like, when I heard that Ludendorff was the villain, I was like, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea because we can equivocate about morality all day, but Ludendorff was one of the main architects for the stab in the back myth, the idea that the Jews and the Bolsheviks were responsible for Germany losing the war. He partnered with Adolf Hitler in the Beer Hall Putsch. Yeah, and that's why I don't know why they killed him. They should have made, because then the real guy lives to continue to cause war. It would have been perfect, I don't know. Uh, what I have a problem with is that, you know, he does all these notorious things after the war. He develops his myth. He was involved in another attempt at a coup. He was also in the cap putsch. He was just a real piece of shit. In fact, the main thing he was remembered at for being good was the victory of Tannenberg, a battle which he won against the Russians. It was actually a different general, Max Hoffman, which did most of that work, but Ludendorff took the credit. And then he blamed Hindenburg for taking the credit. So, like, in multiple levels, he was an asshole. But I thought it was like, oh, clever. This is as close as you can get to a Nazi in World War One is Ludendorff. But they kill him before he does everything he does that gives him that reputation. And what I'm getting to is that he was the leader of the German army at the time near the end of the war. I got to thinking, is that the only reason they made him the bad guy? Because he was the real leader of the German army. There's nothing in the film yeah, connecting true. him to his real life villainy. His villainy is all about this poison gas stuff, which is not something he's actually famous for. Like he's famous for a lot of bad stuff, but he's not famous for deploying poison gas. They went for the twist of having the peaceful guy turn out to be Ares. One, one very small point I want to make. The guy had a mustache. He had a real asshole mustache. Okay? <laughs> he, he had a great asshole. I, you, like it's, I, I, you I know, just love that that's so infuriating. <laughs> well, well I mean, it's just it's, it's that the, there's no details of Ludendorff in the character other than the name. Like, he's such a great guy to do a villain, and I feel like they probably just had it as, like, Fritz McEvil at some point in the script and, like, fill in a name later. Well, um, also, if we're talking about poison gas, they also used poison gas on the other side. So, like, uh, they were both using this hideous weapon. So why is it just the one side that's being blamed for it? Well, that's why it confused me, because throughout the whole movie, they're like, we're going to blow up this plant and it'll end the war. But then evil guy, who is Ares, is like, we're going to sign an armistice and end the war. And I'm like, Armistice sounds nice. That's how the war actually ended. Why don't we stop killing people? And it's like, I, I guess the idea is that this gas is so powerful that it'll turn the tides. But yeah, it was like a lot of gas was going around. This was actually a case for maybe higher stakes. Like, I don't usually say this with the superhero movies because the high stakes thing gets annoying. I got what they're trying to do, but the connection between this gas will continue the perpetuation. What they should have done is Peace Guy is actually Peace Guy. And then Ares is like Ludendorff and a general on the British side or something. And yeah, they're both conspiring to keep the war going Ooh, with this new gas idea. technology. That would have been better. It should have been the guy who was Chris Pine's boss. You know, the one who Wonder Woman blows up against because he's willing to right. go send people to die. That would have been great thematically. She's really angry at the generals. And one of the big pop culture themes that people take from World War One are these impotent generals, you know, drinking tea and sending the working class to go die in their wars. Okay, well, you know, the original Wonder Woman, her origin story is World War II. She fought Nazis in the comics. And, of course, here they put her in World War One. which, why do you think they did that? I assume it's because they were afraid of offending people by suggesting Nazis were just following the orders of a god or something. And there's also less historical baggage for Americans 
with World War One because I think the U.S. just entered the last year of the war and then weren't really involved in the um, giant meat grinders from the earlier parts of the war. But other than that, the movie was basically treating the bad guys as Nazis. I really think they just did it because Captain America had already done World War II, and they didn't want to seem like they were following in Captain America's footsteps. Like, apparently the other German bad guy in the film, Dr. Poison, she was a Wonder Woman villain, but she was a Nazi villain because, of course, Wonder Woman was a World War II character. So they just transported her here and made her a German World War I villain. I think of the two we're discussing, the one that chose World War I to avoid the connotations of World War II was probably Tanya the Evil, because there's an element of World War II in it. But if it was about World War II, its somewhat more sympathetic depictions of Germans would be way more controversial than it is. I think the whole uh, invasion of the country that's clearly Romania on the map but isn't Romania, for example, parallels how Germany invaded Poland in World War II in some oddly specific ways. Like the whole border attack that looks like that the Germans set it up. That's literally what the Germans did to invade Poland. No, I think that, okay, if we're talking just like stuff we had problems with on either side, my problem with Tanya the Evil was they set it in an era that would have been World War I, but it was clearly, particularly by the end of the show, World War II. I yeah, when the, more when the more... Panzer III's appeared at the end of Tanya, yes. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, now we're going to pull out V1s, and are you kidding? Like, the V1s I, I at least accepted, because it's like magic, but for some reason the yeah, tanks but, irritated but, me more. <laughs> uh, and, you know, of course, now Tanya's in Africa, right, by the end of the show. And also, the part of the show that I did not like, the only part that I truly did not like, was at the end, Tanya has a whole speech about a country that invaded other nations because they needed a place to live, right? And what was the whole entire thing with Germany? It was living space, right, in World War II. That was their argument for occupying these nations, living space. They wanted living space for the new Aryan race. And the way that it was presented in Tanya the Evil, it was very sympathetic to this idea that all these guys wanted in this empire was just a place to live, and these people kept fighting against them. And now they have a place to live, and they don't want to commit war anymore, but now everybody's just so afraid of their knife, of their sword, that they're going to try to beat them back. And I was like, come on, show. Like, I don't give a shit if you put it in World War One era. You're clearly drawing this really problematic idea about World War II German occupation, you know, just being like something that was necessary for the nation to survive. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think what they were trying to do there is kind of like the classic balance of power, Thucydides kind of thing, where the not Germany and Tanya is, you know, it's a rising power, and it makes all the other powers freak out because it's rising, and then everybody goes to war to try and claim and or retain, you know, their level of power in the system, and then in, in the show, not Germany, you know, kind of wins. And I think what Tanya's speech is sort of like, what she's more going for there is, you know, all of the sides are completely battered and just decimated by the end of this struggle. And on some level, it makes sense for everyone to stop fighting, but it's like pull out the old hoary Peloponnesian War, where there are like a dozen times in the Peloponnesian War where everybody's like, you know what, I think it's a good time to end it. We should just end it. And then one of the sides is like, no, fuck you, we got the upper hand now. So just keep on going and going. And I think that's sort of what they were going for, like, you know, the country and, you know, the exiles in North Africa or whatever. It's like, maybe peace would be a good thing, but, you know, nationalism and ideology is driving them. Basically, what I'm saying, everybody, is Tanya the Evil is a peak of political realism. You heard it here first. Um, (laughs) No, but, um, I mean, and at the end of the day, it's obviously, you know, the name of the show is Tanya the 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 Evil. Evil. But yeah, I totally it is get it. like the, the not French general is sort of portrayed as a psycho. And I was like, well, he's not a psycho. He's a, his country got blown the fuck out. So, you know, he's he's just a patriot. He just wants to reclaim. Yeah. There's a certain benefit for the series in having this kind of remove where because the character is being portrayed as evil and because there are, are very few characters that have a kind of recognizable moral center and those that do, like her second, are completely overpowered by her. 
that it can kind of have its cake and eat it. It can give Tanya a big speech, but does it agree with the speech or not? It can distance yeah, itself. It's kind of massive. So, like, bit. the difference with Wonder Woman is with Wonder Woman, whatever Wonder Woman learns at the end of the movie is the theme of the movie because the movie is behind Wonder Woman. It's behind her story. It's presenting her as this inspiring figure. This sincerity of the film flattens that distance. So if Wonder Woman does something problematic, we're all very bothered by it and we've discussed it. But, you know, Tanya, in her very first episode, finds people that annoys her, so she makes sure that they die. And she's always doing these very unpleasant things. But because they're being portrayed as unpleasant, because the series is acknowledging this moral messiness, we feel better about it. Or anyway, I do. Yeah, I think that's what makes it work on whole. But when I first started watching... Tanya like I the second episode really hooked me and that's when I began enjoying it a lot but like the first episode I was still unsure if I was going to like it or not because it the sort of have its cake aspect seems a little stronger where is the like distance a shield in the sense that you can always say like well I didn't I didn't wasn't really the themes of my story they're, they're bad or is it actually part of the thematic texture of the story and they're, they're saying something with that level of re- remove which I think they are in this case but there are other properties where they're not. And I, I guess even for anime, it's sort of refreshing just to acknowledge these questionable elements at all. Because you sit, you get so many overpowered, protagon- uh, what was the, the, the magic high school, Mahuka or whatever, where like the, what's the Ayn Rand ideology? Mind blanking. Objectivism. Objectivism. Objectivist God just blows out evil Chinese people for the entire show and it's presented as the best thing of all time. It's like, oh, this is fucking weird. You know, it's not that. So <laughs> that's good. But yeah, I mean, there's space for criticism, of course. Yeah, no, no, no. I Okay, so one thing I did appreciate about the show, I think that the, my big problem was I did feel that Tanya's moral relativism, you know, her complete rational outlook on war and life and stuff like that really was used as kind of a shield, particularly near the end of the show when, when the war started to parallel World War II pretty closely. And again, like, it's the expansionist... Uh, and I know, like, even in the light novel artwork, the uniforms and stuff look more like World War II than they do. Right, right, right. And, so that was um, definitely, like, a conscious decision on the show's part. I yeah, think. I just feel like they kind of hid behind this. And especially with even the war crime stuff where their side is doing this stuff, but it's always presented in, uh, but we had to kind of, you know. Right, it gives it thing. just yeah. enough cover. Yeah, just enough cover where, like, these where guys it's like, are... like, well, there were rebels. And, yeah, yeah, and also the Empire never reaches the level of war crimes that the Germany of World War II did commit. I have very little belief that in the second season of Tanya, we're going to have them stumble upon, like, concentration camps and stuff like that. Right. So it's, like, kind of whitewashing a bit this aspect of World War II to make it make the German side seem more morally acceptable. Uh, equivalent. With my yeah, I'd say more, like, acceptable. Like, because, oh, they're trying to win this war so they could stop the war in the show. You know what I mean? And all the things that Tanya does that are evil, even though they're presented as evil, and even though they're presented as morally messy, they're usually consistent with, oh, this is a clever thing to do to aid the war effort. Like, the people she sends to her death, she doesn't literally shoot them. She just puts them in a position where she thinks they'll die, and they've also been a problem for her. And when she kills people, it's in terms of suppressing dissent. So it's all very logical from a perspective of, I have to win the war, so I have to kill people, I have to intimidate people. She's never just going into a place and saying, oh, these people are the wrong race, I'm just going to kill them all, this isn't helpful, I'm just doing it because I'm sick. All of her evil comes from this kind of rational, logical place, or is presented as such. Well, she specifically said she thought war was a waste or useless or something, but basically she kept being put into that position by being X, essentially. Yeah. But ultimately, however, I would have to say, despite that one criticism, ultimately I do think that the show, for as bonkers of a premise as it is, like, was a really, really good about showing just the weird rationalizations that people have during wartime. You know what I mean? And just how fucked up war makes normal life and normal people, you know, beyond even just Tanya. I really enjoyed that, for instance, that one guy who went after her, who almost died and then went after her and then like really died and then would not stop fighting, even though it was it was his doom, you know, yep. 
I really loved that they had this guy who was just this, he was just a guy, you know, fighting for the other side. And this one person, this one soldier on the other side, so represented all of the death that he witnessed. Even though she was a nine-year-old, ten-year-old girl, he had determined that he was going to get her. And I love that his daughter, who is truly a child, it's not just an aspect of some soul who remembers its past life as a 30-something-year-old dude in Japan, (laughs) you know, like figuring out shit in a little girl body. It's a little girl who lost her father and now... Because, you know, war has driven her to vengeance as well, you know, and she's saying she's doing it so that no other little girls have to experience what she experienced. And it's like, I really enjoy that the show shows that war perpetuates war. Death perpetuates death. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I definitely I, don't have any expectation that the story will end well for most of these characters. So, you know, um, no. whenever... but do any of you have any like predictions to where Tanya is going to end up? I feel like there's some way she'll kill the ex, but she'll also destroy herself in the process. Or be destroyed. There could be like a, what's it, the guy with the glasses, Rugen, Rugen? The, like a administrative guy who seems to have a conscience, or like her oh. second in command. I think there will be some sort of like betrayal there, but it'll be justified. I just call him standard dark-haired glasses man of Tanya the evil. <laughs> yep. I don't know if they'll do anything with him because one of his main purposes as a character seems mostly to inform us that Tanya's evil, to provide a kind of moral barometer for how out there she is more than he is as a person. One thing I do think we will definitely get at some point, and this will inevitably feed into the World War II comparisons, is that they're going to go to war with the Russi Federation, as they call it. They're going to go to war with Russia. Of course, they explicitly said that this is probably going to happen in season one. But I think in season two, we might get to that. And I don't think they're going to be in Africa that long because it's Africa. But on the other hand, they did spend a lot of time in Scandinavia, which is not what I was expecting. So who knows? In the light novels, they do go to the war with Russia. And you see there's a handful of shots of some not Russian generals uh, at the very end of the last episode. Well, about the whole, um, like, how, how much fidelity they have to the World War I history, I'm kind of hoping with the Russian one that they do stick to the real world history because... One of the Germans' secret weapons against Russia was Lenin. They specifically shipped Lenin off back to Russia just so he could start a revolution. So I'm just hoping to see like how completely dumb their version of Lenin is going to be. (laughs) I I think, from what I understand, um, the revolution already happened in the show's world. I think. think Really? Because I thought they were still a. it was no, I feel like I remember reading. I could be wrong, but I think... Well, I mean, confusing the matter is that the name of the country is the Russi Federation, which, aside from sounding silly, it sounds a lot like the name Russia has right now. Right. So, I mean, is this Putin's Russia, but in World War One? What is that? I think it's either, like, revolutionary or just pre-revolutionary. Mm-hmm. So, but who knows? I haven't read the novels, obviously. Hopefully we'll get a season two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's sold very well, so... Um, One thing we'll definitely, I think we'll probably see, which will probably be historically accurate, is and something that people don't talk about that much, is that the Germans won in the Eastern Front. Germans were victorious, yes, partly because of the revolution, but before the revolution, the Russians were doing very badly in the war. The Germans and the Austro-Hungarians pushed on and had multiple victories. And, of course, one of the key victories was Tannenberg, the one that Ludendorff was present for and took credit for, and, of course, was never mentioned in... Um, in Wonder Woman. In Wonder Woman, all, the World War I is almost entirely the Western Front. We get a single reference to the Turks because Dr. Poison is working in Turkey to make her poisons and then never again. And the only reason that that seems to come up is to give Chris Pine, uh, his character, Steve Trevor, a reason to be in the Mediterranean. So he had to be taking something from the Germans in the Mediterranean. So he took it from the Ottoman Empire. Yep. I appreciated seeing a handful of Ottoman uniforms on screen. I was like, all right, here we go. I really thought this film would just have Germany and never mention a single other part of World War I, which is also a problem I had with Tanya. Well, I didn't have it with Wonder Woman because Wonder Woman at least acknowledged the Ottoman Empire. But in Tanya, it's just Germany. And it's just Germany to a point that Austria-Hungary, Germany's principal ally, is also Germany. If you look at the map, they just portray it as one big country. Yeah, I mean, they can... They can fudge it, but it also means that it kind of emphasizes this myth of Germany against the world because they don't have any allies at all. They did mention a couple of times allies. Like, um, apparently the submarine they had in the end was from their allies, but 
we know nothing about these allies. Who the hell are they? Like, where are they? Yeah. So, I mean, the allies have been so erased from the story, we're not sure what they are. I mean, according to Wikipedia, I think Turkey is in the light novels, but I don't think it's part of their alliance, exactly. Right. And even though the whole alliance system is what started World War One in the first place. Yeah. Like, in the show, it's a purely rising power scares everybody into war things. That's like a, I don't know, maybe fourth or fifth episode, Tanya has a little speech, and she's like, we're a rising power. Everyone's going to declare war on us because they're freaking out. That's pretty much the kind of, it's a purely sort of macro political explanation for what happens, which maybe this sort of gets back into like the why they chose this aspect. It kind of strips the ideology out of the, at least the starting reasons for the war. And so you don't have those maybe questionable overtones that people might take issue with. Well, bringing it back to World War II, Hitler was actually, a, I believe, a corporal in the German army at the time. And I'm going to assume there's no Hitler equivalent in Tanya. But Wonder Woman, her world is basically our world with superheroes, right? So if she was fighting for peace, obviously she failed because there was World War II in 20 years. Well, you know, like I said, <laughs> humans well, are uh... always, eh, we're just a bunch of jokers. Start yeah, I mean, with two on accident. The story, apparently, as I understand it, with Wonder Woman is Wonder Woman starts out believing that humans are basically good and that they only have a war because of Ares. And by the end of the film, she learns that humans are more complicated than that, so maybe they could have a war without Ares. It's a little ambiguous in framing because the film also attributes a lot of World War One to Ares' behind-the-scenes machinations for some reason. It's a little unclear how much he's to blame. But I guess the idea is, ultimately, you can take him out of the equation and war will still happen. Yeah, he well, his whole entire thing was that wars happen regardless of him. He didn't start the wars. He just, like, say, gave somebody a, an epiphany about a certain formula or gave somebody an epiphany about a certain place to attack or, you know what I mean? Like, so I assume that Ares was correct in his reasoning. He was just kind of, like, behind the scenes helping people destroy themselves, but he didn't directly go like, hey, guys, wouldn't it be great if you went to war? <laughs> so. Ares has killed uh, poor old Franz Ferdinand himself. <laughs> Ares is basically nagging people. Give yeah, peace yeah. a chance. Give peace a chance. Give peace a chance. Yeah, give peace a chance. But, uh, oh, man, you're a... Uh... Your country's looking a little weak with all that peace over there, but uh, good for you on the peace, you know? Like, Look at how insufferable I am with peace. I mean, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. you prefer war? Than... <laughs> <What do> you... <laughs> I, I guess I have a certain amount of unearned hostility towards David Thewlis because he was in the last season of Fargo, and I just want to mention somewhat gratuitously, that was a terrible character he played. And it wasn't really entirely his fault. A lot of it was the writing, but it was just a really annoying character on a series I think is pretty bad. I just feel that David Thewlis signed up because he was like, I get to, do you realize I'm never like the badass? <laughs> it's like, I will be the badass. I want to wear a giant, ridiculous piece of armor. <laughs> it's definitely not what you would typecast him as. Um, yeah, you would not typecast him as a Greek god. No, not at all. It, it was, uh, honestly, it was kind of hard to buy that this is how he looks. Like, when they revealed that, oh, he's really Ares, I thought the thing was going to be that this was like an avatar of Ares. He just assumed this form to be an English minister. No, no, he always looked like that. Like, we go back to a flashback. Yes. Like, when Although he's thrown he... out of Olympus, he looks like that, but younger. He's always been... Although, they gave, like, like, they gave him, like, just all the abs in that scene, too. I was like, damn! Foolish, well, you are you rich. Know, great, the Greek gods have some great mustaches. You heard it here first. Uh, Thulis should have been Ludendorff. Well, with he really should have been Ludendorff. Yeah. Oh, well. well. I mean, not just Ares should be Ludendorff. Thulis should have played Ludendorff. I mean, he's not German, but Houston wasn't German either. And, you know, almost nobody in this film was German. And the German accents were, eh, you know, well, they were trying anyway. I yeah. mean, it's always kind of great when, you know, Everybody who is probably actually speaking German to each other actually only speaks in that outrageous accent. <laughs> I think, like, that's one of my favorite aspects of historical movies. And it's not like there's a shortage of German actors popular in Hollywood who could have appeared in this movie, or they could have just found someone else. Like, um, Daniel Bruhl came up to my mind a lot because he was in one of the last big movies about World War One. 
like last decade, Joyeux Noël, which is an anti-war film because it's about soldiers at Christmas time observing an armistice. So it frames it as, you know, the soldiers are reaching over, they're both people, and their officers are kind of assholes, and the war system is bad. And it's also a good example of metatextually distancing World War One from World War Two because the character Daniel Bruhl plays in that film, he's a German, and he's a German officer. But record scratch, he's a Jew. He's a Jew who's a German officer and a German patriot. And they don't put a literal record scratch in the movie, but you can have the movie kind of feel that disconnect. Like, oh, you weren't expecting that audience, were you? Yeah, we're surprising you with this. It's almost as if before World War Two, guys, like, maybe. <laughs> Maybe, like, German Jewish patriots were a thing. I don't know. Like, I mean. And it's a direct <laughs> repudiation of our good friend Eric Ludendorff with his image of Jews oh, living yes. at home, not fighting on the front. This whole idea of Jews as a disassociated people from German politics, which was, you know, popularized by Ludendorff and the Nazis. And honestly, that would have, I mean, and not that Wonder Woman should have just ripped off Joy and Noel, but... It would have been interesting if they'd ripped off Joy and Noel. That's what I would have done. I mean, had like a sympathetic German character. Write them a strongly worded letter. Yeah, I was going to say, Will, you're basically like, hey, movie producers, keep on ripping off other movies that are better. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a winning strategy. Isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the DCU definitely needs it from the sounds of it, so. I mean, to be fair to them, this was like, the people over at uh, Warner Brothers, they've had a pretty rough go of superhero films for the past couple of years. I hadn't seen the last ones they'd done before Wonder Woman, the 2016 films, the Batman and Superman one and the Su- Suicide Squad. So I just watched those this weekend to prepare myself for this podcast. And I watched the full extended cut versions, just in case anyone asks. Oh my. And, uh, my condolences. Yeah, well, you know, one person on Twitter said that the extended version of Batman Superman was the better one. And maybe it is a better one, but it's a bad movie. These are really bad films. And this film comes along, and it's competently made. It has a plot that flows together. It has character motivations that basically make sense. Like, we're picking apart how it's treating World War I, but what happens with Diana, her motivations, what she tries to do, and what she learns. Yeah. In terms of the logic of the film, this all makes... It's, it's structured coherently. It's great. Uh, because that's really not something the last two films did at all. Yeah. Because it's kind of rambled around. Like, what the hell were they going on with? The thing is, these are like the minimum that you're supposed to be doing for movies anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> these are like... It's a really low bar that the film cleared, but even though that's a low bar, it's also a good film. I sat down, I watched it, and with the first two films I mentioned, I was on my phone a lot because I was bored, and with this, I was not bored. I didn't check my phone during watching the film on TV. I wanted to see what happened next. I was engaged. I cared about the characters, and there were stakes. There were even things that happened to them, because one problem I have with superhero films, not just the DC films, but also the Marvel films, is that often not a lot happens. Like Civil War, the movie where Iron Man fights Captain America. And Daniel Bruhl shows up, by the way. See, he was available for these kind of movies. Nothing really changes. The most that happens is one character gets his legs broken, but he's going to be fine in a couple movies because he's getting help with technology. But in this film, you know, spoiler alert, Steve Trevor dies. He does the big sacrifice. Poor Chris Pine. I literally wept. I was so sad because poor Chris Pine. Yeah, I'll give Wonder Woman credit. Like, it's not it's like an amazing character study or something, but like all the characters have little beats. They have little personalities. The romance is kind of cute. Like that stuff works. Oh yeah, I just want to go back to the actor thing for a moment because you know that's like a very self congratulatory moment when the guy says, "I want to be an actor, but I can't because of the wrong skin color." Now, obviously, racism existed and racism was endemic in cinema of the 1920s, but it's not that there weren't actors of color. They just weren't getting starring roles, and they weren't getting many roles. But what they would sometimes get is they would get a minor supporting role, if you see where I'm going with this. In other words, it'd be... <laughs> yeah. In fact, I can think of films, in fact, even British films, with bigger roles for minority actors from around this period, or at least a couple of years afterwards. I was going to say Piccadilly, which is a film where Anna Mae Wong is the second build female lead. But that's not 1929, so that might be a little too far in the future to count. But it seems a little too self-congratulatory. Yeah, it's the same thing Amber was mentioning where it's like, Ah, oh, you wear these silly skirts. We got to get out the vote, am I right? I'm a, <laughs> yeah. I'm a lady. 
Okay, since we're mentioning modern ladies, I would like to bring up the aspect of feminist take on both of these shows, or both the show and the movie. Because, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, Wonder Woman has been touted all summer as a super pro lady movie, right? Female director, female main character, literally a island full of kick-ass women, you know what I mean? And also, you've got Tanya, who is, while, yes, the former life was a dude, at the moment, her current life is as a small girl, right? A little girl who is incredibly competent. And her second is also a woman who is also very competent. Like, both of them are very good at what they do for different reasons. And it looks like, in the second season, a main challenger to Tanya will be yet another little girl. So I want to just throw out here that for any of the um, downsides of either the show or the movie, it is pretty kick-ass to see a woman on screen kicking ass and never becoming the victim, right? Because a lot of times, if you do have a woman on screen who kicks ass, at some point, she's either a side character, like, say, your Black Widows, or she's shown to have some serious vulnerabilities, like, say, your Black Widows, and, I mean, like, emotional, right? And or she becomes a victim at some point. And neither Wonder Woman nor Tanya ever become the victim, or Tanya's second. They never are the victims. They never become victims. They are always good at what they do, even if, say, in Wonder Woman's case, for instance, she's not right about who to target, you know, and she's not right about humanity, right? But, like, she still has a lesson to learn. But when she is out and fighting, she is on point. And when her people fight the Germans on their island, they succeed in just destroying that unit that attacks them, even with swords and goddamned bows and arrows, you know? And you've got Tanya, who is totally doing things out of her own self-interest, but she is very good at what she does, you know? And I don't know, it's just nice to see that and also it's not really i mean they did have the scene in wonder woman they do mention a few times you know it's a lady on the field and stuff like that but like once she shows her competence that never comes up again nobody ever like holds her back and says but you're still a lady you know it's like oh no wait no she's bulletproof guys she's like bulletproof she can go first (laughs) so like i just want to say It's just neat because it's not something that you see very often. And I wish we could see more of women just kicking ass, you know. I mean, there are more movies out and more TV shows out nowadays where a woman can kick ass and or lead something without it being a big fucking deal. But the reason why, you know, we have so many think pieces about Wonder Woman is because, and everybody like losing their fucking minds, is because, you know, it's just not something, it's still not something we see commonly for it to be uncommented on. So, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, about the Amazons, I believe, like, uh, the ones in the background, they're all CrossFit athletes, which is why they're also Jack. And I, I think, I forget who mentioned it, but someone who was working on the movie was just saying how unusual it was to have, like, a shooting something, and, like, a, it's basically just one army of badass women that they didn't remember ever doing anything with so many women just doing the fighting. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, you're ac- you're right. Like it's like I can't think of like like a whole army where like like I'm trying to now I'm like legitimately trying to think of a time where I've seen a lot of women fighting in a show or a cartoon or a, I guess Steven Universe because they're all women, you know, like fighting. But even that is pretty fucking recent. I have an example that sort of proves your point is that um a lot of the horse riders of Rohan were women because they had to get people who rode horses and a lot of women rode horses professionally or rode it as a hobby and so they just slapped beards on them so people wouldn't notice oh really? so I they, I oh, yeah four, yeah yeah fourth airling lass and then, and then most of the people behind them i think particularly one scene they singled out as being mostly women is the first one when you first see aylmer are you kidding me i'm not kidding i heard it on the dvd commentary so keep an eye on those women there 
Great. That's well. See now, that actually kind of pisses me off a little bit because it would have been kick ass if they were all portrayed as women. But I guess oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the point is just kind of funny that women are so involved in these films up to that point of actually being on the horses, doing the fight scenes, and then being turned into men. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's utterly absurd in a way. This is totally like sidetracked, but I forgot in the books was Rohan egalitarian kind of thing where they like men and women so. ride. Row no, over no, the no. Okay. Um, okay, remember, okay. Eowyn's entire arc is about that not being the case. Oh, right. She had to go to war as a man. Okay, yeah, yeah, she did. Though you know, to be fair, she had a lot of company. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think we've reached the end of this once we were on Lord of the Rings. So Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, the same final question that we always ask. Would you recommend these films? Uh, for me personally, uh, sorry, films and TV show. Um, for me personally, yes, I did find them entertaining. Like um, Wonder Woman, it is the first DC comic book film in a while that actually you can enjoy without I don't know, being a gigantic fan of the comic book character who manages to turn off the critical part of their brain. But um, but yeah, you can like it. You don't even need to be a fan. You can watch it. It's fun. It's a setting that you don't really see a lot in Hollywood, World War One. My theory on that is because this Hollywood is, uh, is in the U.S. and World War II is the war in the American consciousness. But anyway, Wonder Woman is fun. It gets you what you want, which is a superhero film. A uh, saga of Tanya the Evil, it's very entertaining. I assume the light novels were very popular because it's very well made. Have you seen how detailed the backgrounds were and the action scenes, like so many angles going everywhere? That's actually pretty hard to do. And I think it was the studio's first full anime, too. So really? Oh, well, I'm I very impressed. So. Okay. But yeah, so I recommend both of these things. If you're not wanting to think too critically, you just want pure entertainment, go for both of these. Watch Wonder Woman, watch Saga of Tanya the Evil. I would agree with all those points. Wonder Woman is, you know, like we talked about before, definitely had my issues with it, but I think it's a, it's a competently made superhero movie and a fun time period. If you are interested in World War One and stuff, it's just sort of fun to see all the uniforms on screen and the time period, and just, there's some nice environmental shots of, you know, early 20th century London and things like that. And, you know, it's just, it's well put together. It's very watchable. And Tiny the Evil, for sure, one of my favorite shows from that season. I think it does interesting things in a sh- kind of medium that's awash in these sort of hyper-rational, uh, overpowered protagonists right now. And, you know, that gets very boring and sort of thematically is very empty and just sort of tries to do different things. And, like, as with Wonder Woman, in a lot of ways, it's clearly made by some people who are kind of military nerds and uh, that shows on the screen and in terms of the, you know, uniforms and environmental art and all that stuff. It's really kind of detailed and nice. So, yeah, I recommend them quite strongly, both. I would definitely wreck both of them. I really enjoyed Wonder Woman. You know, there were parts of it, again, that were eh, but, like, Ultimately, I really thought that it was well done. I thought it was fun to watch. I thought that the character of Diana was fun to watch, which is actually kind of, to be perfectly honest, it's a little bit rare to have um, the pro tag of one of these superhero movies be truly interesting. For instance, I don't find Thor all that interesting, you know, or banner all that interest you know what i mean like yeah i got you it's the things happening around them but i really liked how diana the character was drawn so yeah it is a pretty typical superhero movie so i mean you're not going to see like anything like really revolutionary aside from the fact that it's a woman who is kicking ass but other than that it's still fun tanya the evil i definitely recommend i think one thing that we didn't get into at all is It is funny. It's really darkly hilarious. There are some pretty grim things that happen in this show, but ultimately, like, I laughed more than I felt, like, broody, you know what I mean, while watching this. Especially because Tanya's plans are so simple. She just wants to rise in the ranks enough to have an easy life. And being X keeps getting in the way. And her reactions to this or her reactions to realizing that she didn't just excel enough to get promoted something somewhere. She excelled to the point where she was promoted into battle. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah, we, you're right. It is. There's a there's a real dark uh, humor to it that keeps it from being grimdark and sort of yeah, exactly. makes, it, yeah. makes it fun to watch. That reminded me of one thing I wanted to compare about 
the two things. I know we're kind of wrapping up here, but Diana is charging to war. She's looking for war at every opportunity. She's like, send me to the front. Whereas Tanya is trying to get as far away from the front as she can. But yes, these two different scaling up. <laughs> these two trajectories get them to the same end in the end. But it's, it's kind of funny to watch. Yeah, no, no, no. And so, like, and really, the premise is so fucking bonkers. I mean, they're like mages using guns in World War One, and like flying. The flying mechanisms that they have are fantastic. Every battle, every army has their own. Like all of the English people fly fucking broomsticks. Oh, yeah, the, the, the English fly bird sticks, the Scandinavians have flying skis, and the geez, French have flying the French horses. horses. <laughs> it's so great. Only in like, anime, everybody. Yeah, no, 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 seriously, like, there were a few times that at the end of the episode, I was like, what am I watching? This is amazing. So, yeah, you know, even beyond the messages of what war is and blah, 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 and its details where war nerds are clearly on board with this and the character itself being an interesting and fascinating character. Like, it's just kind of fun to watch. So, yeah, Rex for both. William? Yeah, so um, I guess a couple of things I would say about in terms of whether to watch these films is something I generally like about superhero films that we haven't touched on directly is having a lot of costumes and set designs. The more they lean towards fantasy, the more I'm a little more inclined to them because when they're very real world stuff and it's all real cities being destroyed, that works if it's a good movie like The Dark Knight. But if it isn't a good movie, I kind of check out a little because I like kind of elaborate fantasy settings. And this film really goes all in in some nice ways. Like it has the historical period of World War One to play with, but it also does things like a kind of Baroque moving painting of the fall of the gods early in the film and the kind of Thor-like, Lord of the Rings-like fantasy island of Themyscira. So it has all these nice costumes. And as a film, as has been said, it's an above-average superhero film. This is one that's well-made, has an engaging lead. It also has engaging supporting cast members. Chris Pine is very good in this film, although I think generally he's been quite good in these kind of um, big franchise films. I enjoyed him in the three Star Trek films he's done. So I'd recommend it if you like superhero films. I would also add that it does not require past knowledge of the previous DC films it's notionally connected to. I watched those in prep, as I mentioned, and they're bad. People told me I shouldn't watch them, and I said, okay, but I'm going to watch them anyway. And I'm now going to tell you, you know, don't watch them. And if you do, you know, don't blame me. As for Tiny the Evil, it's a lot of fun. It's funny. And something that has been mentioned is that it has a decent amount of map porn. Is I really like maps, and we get a couple of maps in the series, and half the time I was watching it, I was just trying to figure out how the maps in the series related to the maps of the real World War One. In fact, if you check the tweets of our account and check this hashtag saga of Tiny the Evil, a lot of the times I'm just trying to figure out how those things relate to each other. And so if, if you enjoy that kind of tension between a thinly veiled version of history and history, it has that. So I'd recommend both of those. We watched some good things this episode, guys. Yeah, no, this was great. I, I really enjoyed both well, of know. these. It was a real good, like, runner up from the crap fest from last time. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, give me a minute. Just, just, just two two points. <laughs> no, no, I was like going to say, like, what you going to bring in this time? <laughs> well, just, uh, he didn't really do a lot about World War One, unfortunately. Or did he? As for... Our good friend, Alfred Hitchcock. The uh, one with the Statue of Liberty was in a war. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say... <laughs> I'm going... Yeah, you're right. You're right. In fact, that particular film is named Saboteur. That's right. Yeah. So I'm just going to say Saboteur. You, you, saved, you saved it, Tom. You saved the Hitchcock. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's tradition now. To listen and everybody. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Again. Uh, if you like what you hear, please leave a review on iTunes. Thank you to the single reviewer who gave us a positive review. Oh, you stranger. I hope you're still listening because shout out. <laughs> and we're available also on our blog, Podcast in the Sky at WordPress.com. You can see us on Twitter at Flying Podcastle, right? Uh, and we're also available on Stitcher and iTunes and uh, YouTube now. So check us out. You don't see our faces, though. No, no, we, yeah.
Yeah. I'm waiting They're... to get my emo hair and a flat baseball cap and to fill my room with pop culture garbage and then we can film. <laughs> I feel like it's okay if I'm just a disembodied voice forever. So I think it's I think it's better that way for all of us and the listeners. Yes. Yeah. They can live in mystery. We can live in mystery for them. <laughs> And so our next episode is going to be about superheroes. Again, wait, well, actually it is, but comedic superheroes. The anime One Punch Man and the Amazon Prime TV series The Tick. That'll be interesting. Yay. Good Yay. episode. Okay, I think we're good. We're good. Yay. Yay. Yeah, that's it. Episode 12, which only took us a little bit over two years to reach. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's so crazy. <laughs> Hey, you know, I feel like... It's, I feel it's like a wrap I'm... on the first season. Yeah. yeah it's a wrap on the first season. <laughs>